Hi, this is Don Forsyth speaking of groups and dynamics and in particular leadership. Uh, in earlier presentations we discussed the nature of leadership, stressing for example the two basic tendencies for leaders to engage in both task and relationship oriented behaviors. In the previous presentation we also talked about who will emerge as, as the leader within the group and examined a couple of different theories that try to explain that such as implicit leadership theory, social identity theory, social role theory, and so on. All of those theories are relevant also, in a sense, for explaining who will be an effective leader. Because in many cases, an individual emerges in the group, is supported by group members, and that support allows the individual to be successful as a leader. Um, leaders must be capable of influencing other individuals. And when those individuals believe uh, that that person in their group is a leader and deserving of the leadership role, they'll be more likely to accept influence from that person. So in a sense, it, it, leadership is, is based on a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, whereas the group members believe that this individual has the skills and the characteristics which qualify them to be the leader, and so they accept that person's influence. And as a result of that, the, the source of the influence, the leader, feels empowered, feels stronger, um, their, their sense of leadership, self-efficacy increases, and they are transformed from an individual who is influential into a leader of a group. We're going to only be able to talk very briefly about various leadership theories. I, I urge you, if you're interested in this topic, to explore other sources. Uh, for example, uh, Gary Uckel's book, Leadership in Organizations, is an excellent one to examine if you're interested in leadership. Uh, then there's the big book. Bernard Bass's Handbook of Leadership, fairly substantial, um, in, in which he ex examines in these uh, 1,400 pages uh, basic theories of leadership. We'll have to only briefly summarize theories of leadership in this seg segment, but thank you as always for joining me. We'll start with a classic Fiedler's Contingency Theory of Leadership. Fiedler's theory is often described as a contingency theory because he argues that leadership is contingent upon two sets of factors, um, aspects of the individual, the person, the, the leader, and also aspects of the situation. When he focuses on the, the person, the person variable, uh, he believes, as many do, that leaders, leadership involves both task and relationship-oriented behavior. But Fiedler, relatively uniquely, believes that uh, most individuals uh, lean in one direction rather than the other. That people are by nature, by tendency, by experience, either task-oriented or relationship, and rarely both. And this basic idea is, of course, uh, supported by status differentiation processes, role differentiation, which does indicate that it's very difficult for most people to be very strong in both task and relationship-oriented leadership. Fiedler measured this particular tendency in a relatively unique way with his least preferred co-worker scale, in which he asked respondents to think, imagine, of that one individual who they had the most difficulty working with, the past, with in the past, and then rate that person on a series of bipolar adjective scales. Uh, he believed that individuals who had relatively low ratings of the least preferred co-worker are task-oriented individuals. And those individuals who, even though they were rating their least preferred co-worker, gave that person relatively high ratings, well, the only explanation for that would be that they must be relationship-oriented. So the, the relationship versus task-oriented style of leadership was Fiedler's person variable. And on the side of situation variables, he, he identified three aspects of the situation which were important to take into account. Um, and those were whether or not leader-member relationships are good or bad, whether or not the task the group is working on is structured or unstructured, and whether or not the leader's position within the group is a powerful one, uh, he or she is, has a strong leadership position, or whether or not their position is a relatively weak one and ill-defined. So high LPC argue, leaders, he argued, are most effective in moderately favorable situations. Um, 
situations which are good, perhaps unstructured, weak, these center areas versus low LPC leaders are most affected in very favorable or very unfavorable situations. So this is usually, this, this rather complicated hypothesis is usually summarized in this rather complicated chart where he shows the eight different leadership situations here. So situation one is good, structured, and strong. Situation two is good, structured, but position power is weak. Leadership situation three is g still good, but unstructured and strong. And four is good, unstructured, and weak, and so on, all the way to situation eight, which is bad, unstructured, and weak. So clearly situations over here are um, unfavorable situations for a leader. Situations over here are quite favorable for the leader. So which style of leadership is most effective across these eight situations? And according to his basic hypothesis is that leaders who are relationship oriented, in other words, they give high ratings to their least preferred coworker, are most effective in these middle situations, situations, perhaps situation three, but certainly in situations four, five, and six, um, which are moderately favorable. The, the relationship oriented leader will be most successful. Whereas in more extreme situations, particularly in very bad leadership situations, bad for the leader in, in, other, in any case, in extremely favorable situations, then a task-oriented leader will be most effective. And research does tend to bear out his hypothesis. But that's just one style theory. There are many other style theories. And, and by that, I, I mean theories which argue that leaders have particular styles uh, of dealing with people and that different styles are variously effective in different situations. Although some leadership theories suggest that certain styles across situations are most effective. And that's the case for Blake and Mouton's leadership grid theory where they identified five um, basic styles of leadership, although there are many more than that, but they focused their attention on these five, um, which they identified based on the two dimensions of concern for people, high versus low, and concern for production. Again, reminiscent of our distinction between task-oriented leadership and relationship-oriented leadership. But if an individual is, is, is motivated to achieve both of these outcomes, they have a strong concern for production and, however, they have a strong concern for people, then they would be a 9-9 type of leader. Um, they would be committed to accomplishing their tasks through interdependent work with others, and certainly not exploitive work with others. Uh, and of course, the least productive style of leadership would be the 1-1 one -one style of leadership, in which such leaders are really not concerned with production or with the people they're working with. So it tends to be a very ineffective style of leadership. Hersey and Blanchard expanded on this basic idea in their theory. Um, they too suggest that perhaps there's types of leadership. And the same two themes have emerged. Directive leader, meaning that they're fairly task focused, versus the supportive leader who's more relationship oriented. So we have perhaps a coach which is both very directive but also very supportive. They refer to that as the coaching style of leadership. If you are not supportive, but you are still directed, then you are a directing, a telling style of leadership. If you are high in supporting, but low in directive, you are supporting, and you're more of a delegating leadership. Um, so across, these are the four basic styles of leadership. Interesting from the Hersey and Blanchard theory, they suggest that different styles of leadership are best in different kinds of situations. Um, and the reason it's this chart is shown with these arrows moving in this direction, they suggest that for a new group, um, an immature group, a group that is just forming and beginning its work, it's best to focus on direction. Um, don't focus your attention on being supportive. Coaching should come later, after you engage in directing highly structuring behaviors. But after the group has achieved a degree of structure, you can shift towards providing more supportive forms of leadership, and then you can shift towards coaching. And beyond that, once the group is well organized, 
group members are working together effectively to achieve shared goals. You can reduce the degree to which you direct their behavior, uh, but still maintain a high level of support for their behavior. So you shift to a supporting style of leadership. And eventually in the long run, the, the group is performing fine, even without your support. So you can delegate leadership to the entire group. And Hertz and Blanchard refer to that as their situation leadership theory. Uh, another well-known theory and, and well-supported theory of leadership is uh, LMX, uh, abbreviated Leader Member Exchange Theory. This theory uh, focuses on the relationship between the leader and each group member. Uh, the previous theories uh, collapse across all group members, suggesting that a leader should act in a particular way when dealing with the group as a whole. But that doesn't take into account that uh, each leader has a unique relationship with each group member. Uh, and leader member exchange theory stresses, five, stress of, stresses the quality of that relationship between the leader and the follower. This theory does suggest that, m that, that very few leaders can maintain a strong, positive relationship with all the members of a group, particularly as groups increase in size. So it's a natural tendency for the leader to have strong reciprocal bonds with certain members of the group and weaker bonds with other members of the group. And as a result of that, usually two, two basic cliques form within most groups. Uh, group members who, although ne not necessarily estranged from the leader, do not feel closely connected to their leader. They have a weak, a, a relatively weak leader member exchange bond versus other group members who feel closely bonded with their leaders. They experience and, and enjoy a strong leader member exchange bond. The goal, of course, for the leader is to try to minimize the number of individuals in the out group who do not feel connected to them as the leader and maximize the number of individuals who are within the group. Other theories as well stress the idea that perhaps uh, leadership should be uh, distributed throughout the group, that the more of the responsibilities of the leader are shared with the other group members, then the more effective the group can be in the long run, particularly if the leader cannot be present across all situations. So shared leadership theories recommend co-leadership, collective leadership, or peer leadership, it's called distributing leadership responsibilities across the group. Lou and Lippitt and White in their classic uh, experiment investigated three different kinds of leadership, one of which was a shared leadership model, the democratic leadership style. Uh, as you might recall, um, Lou and Lippitt and White created groups of young boys working on hobby crafts after school and they placed leaders, adult male leaders in each of these groups and those adult male leaders enacted one of three types of leadership styles, either an autocratic style, which was very directive, um, highly structured, democratic, where the group members shared in the leadership processes and were able to, to vote um, and make their own choices for the group's activities, and then the laissez-faire leader, which was a relatively non-directive leader, providing very little leadership at all. Um, and, of course, an interesting historical point is the, uh, the laissez-faire leadership condition was not actually part of the original design, but resulted because one of the leaders during the research process had a very difficult time being autocratic. Um, and as a result, even though he was supposed to order the young boys around, he instead um, did very little when he was in the autocratic condition. So that particular condition was renamed the laissez-faire leadership condition. But the results of that study supported the effectiveness of a democratic style of leadership, suggesting that um, in autocratic groups, although they worked at a high level when the leader was present, when the leader was not present, um, those groups tended to loaf, become uh, unproductive. Although a close look at the original report does indicate that in some autocratically led groups, uh, the groups became very dedicated to the leader and continued to work even when the leader was not present. Um, Robert Kelly has developed more recently a, a theory of followership, 
which suggests that although we focus primarily on leadership in this chapter, and in fact in analyses of leadership overall, it would be best if we paid more attention to the different kinds of followers which exist in groups. And he identified, well, at least five key followers to take into account. Conformist followers who are very active and energized, more passive followers, um, given their relatively negative label, uh, sheep, um, who follow the lead of others without great enthusiasm or commitment to the group. Pragmatic followers, the more typical followers are the rank and file members of the group who are not all that active, but they certainly do the work that they're appointed to. Oh, yeah, alienated followers are not committed at all to the group and its goals, um, and they tend to maintain excessive levels of inner independence. They don't work well with others, and contrast those four types with the exemplary or star follower within the group, who's very actively engaged in the group, but at the same time is not just simply carrying out the leader's orders, but often doing leadership behavior themselves, um, identifying new things, goals for the groups to form, and ways for the group to form even more effectively. Ah, look, and there's a quick chart of Lewin, Lippitt, and White's original findings from their autocratic, democratic, and laissez-faire leadership theories. And this is a chart of Kelly's theory of followership. We are about out of time, so let me just mention briefly transformational leadership theories. There really are two basic transformational leadership theories. James McGregor Burns transformational theory, in which he argues that uh, one of the key responsibilities of a leader is transforming followers, shifting them, um, improving um, their experiences to the point where they actually become more ethical, um, more robust, more motivated over time. Um, Bernard Bass's transformational theory, on the other hand, um, focuses more on, more specifically on charismatic forms of leadership. And he draws a distinction between transactional leadership, in which leaders and followers trade back energy and resources and time to achieve mutually satisfying goals, and transformational leadership, which involves four basic components, which he measures in his multi-factor leadership questionnaire, which is by far the most widely investigated measurement index in leadership. You would think that Fiedler's least preferred co-worker scale would have caught on, but in fact it's the MLQ, the multi-factor leadership questionnaire, which is the dominant survey used in the study of leadership. And it measures both transactional leadership tendencies and transformational leadership tendencies, including idealist influence, expressing one's conviction clearly and emphasizing trust and taking stands on issues, inspirational motivation, which is more closely related to charismatic leadership, intellectual stimulation, so raising important issues, um, establishing the mission of the group, and individualized consideration, which is a relationship form of leadership, dealing with others as individuals and taking into account their relationship needs. Um, the case study uh, for this chapter examined Wendy Kopp, um, who was the founder of Teach for America. Uh, and the analysis of her tendencies suggests that as we move into the future of leadership, that the bias against women leaders, I would hope, uh, would, would weaken over time, that for the most part women are barred from leadership roles due to sexism and stereotyped thinking, but th that as sexism and stereotypes decline over time, um, women won't be as likely as men to be able to emerge as leaders within groups. And overall, given their, their basic tendencies, their orientation towards transformational leadership styles, um, groups of the future perhaps will be better led, better served by women leaders rather than male leaders. Thank you as always for joining me in the analysis of groups and their dynamics. Have a good day.